Okay, good morning, students. This is a seminar of criminal justice, <clears throat> the second lecture for two. I'll try to rename this a little later. I'll have your test grades back for you <clears throat> the day after tomorrow. Unfortunately, however, I'm coming down with <clears throat> a bad case of laryngitis plus who knows what else. So <clears throat> this morning's lecture will be somewhat shortened because <clears throat> I'll soon run out of voice and <clears throat> the microphone here doesn't do whispers very well. We pretty much beat the issue of law enforcement concerns and other issues uh, to the ground. And so this part of the class is a discussion of the courts and the uh, court systems and it really starts here on page 255, where there's a nice little discussion of the judicial system uh, here in the United States. And it starts talking about something discussed in lots of other things, the so called <coughs> courtroom work group. Uh, a phrase and concept quite common in literature. <clears throat> and basically over the fact that normally speaking, <clears throat> once a case has gotten past the grand jury aspect, that is an indictment has been returned, <clears throat> then comes the issue of trial or no trial. <clears throat> and there's three prominent players <clears throat> in, in these things, and the three prominent most the three prominent players are the prosecutor, the defense attorney, and the judge. <clears throat> and contrary to popular belief, from watching television shows and movies. <clears throat> The judge is not the most important of the three. <clears throat> In fact, I would say the judge is the least important of the three. Except, apparently, in the state of Virginia. <clears throat> and I say that because in the state of Virginia, <clears throat> yeah, most peculiarly, <clears throat> the bulk of criminal trials are not tried in front of juries, but in tried only in front of judges. <clears throat> it's called a bench trial. <clears throat> uh, and this is true, again, we're talking about felony cases here, so <clears throat> it is, uh, to me, very, very surprising how few <clears throat> jury trials are held in Virginia <clears throat> because of the belief that <clears throat> judges will hear and uh, <clears throat> evaluate the evidence in a criminal case better than juries. The problem that I have with the system of bench trials being so commonly used <clears throat> is because it takes the issue of chance out of the relationship. Chance meaning that sometimes even the most guilty of parties can have an innocent verdict returned by a jury vice versa, <clears throat> but it is still that possibility. Likewise, even the most guilty parties 
as we've seen time and time again here in West Virginia, <clears throat> could have a hung jury in the case, which essentially means that <clears throat> the prosecutor is forced to re retry the case or come up with a plea bargaining deal much more lenient than what they previously thought of offering. <clears throat> if that is the case, <clears throat> you have to, again, excuse me, I, this onset of laryngitis started the uh, night before last. It certainly was showing up in my lectures yesterday. <clears throat> I don't know how far I'm going to get. Anyway, <clears throat> um, if it's a judge only hearing the case, despite what people the want to presume, judges do have biases and judges do have prejudices. And thus it is that you take your life in your hands with only one person, whereas 12 could do. Now, my counterpart, Professor Rasny, likes to have been trial saying <clears throat> that's the way it should go. But again, uh, I would suggest that the use, exclusive use of bench trials is the exception rather than the rule in this country. <clears throat> and that most defense attorneys dislike the concept of trying a felony case in front of the, jury, the judge only, particularly if they think there's significant evidence <clears throat> in the case to prove or to suggest to a jury that uh, the defendant may be innocent of the crime. And if the case uh, of the prosecution is exceptionally weak, once more again, all the more reason <clears throat> to use the threat of the jury trial uh, to gain some advantage from the court. At any rate, <clears throat> In those states in which jury trials are the most prevalent, the role of the judge basically is of a referee. Now, <clears throat> I'm always talking about <clears throat> the fact that in a jury typical jury criminal trial it is a contest, just like a sporting event. Two teams going at each other, <clears throat> prosecution on one side, the defense on the other side, <clears throat> and the judge who is supposed to be a neutral party, <clears throat> in other words, a, a basketball referee, if you will, since this is March, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> Supposedly, uh, looking at infractions that both sides may have or issues that both sides may have and ruling uh, <clears throat> intelligently or going to the wall. But once again, judges are human. And <clears throat> this initial article talks about that issue. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, here on page 259, it makes a common. Uh, I realize that this was written some time back. It says, while the public watched the courtroom proceedings of the Casey Anthony trial and the Dr. Conrad Murray trial, I know you all know who Casey Anthony is. Who's Dr. Conrad Murray? He's not Dr. Al Michael Jackson. That's Michael Jackson's doctor. Who, overdosed to uh, fentanyl. <clears throat> Before fentanyl was as popular as it is today among drug addicts. <clears throat> okay. 
Since they expected the judge was a neutral arbiter between the state and the accused, and that he would, if either of them was convicted, he would provide a fair and biased sentence. Americans believe the judge, more than any other person in the system, symbolizes and is expected to embody justice. <clears throat> Okay. The public expects judges to make careful, consistent decisions that uphold the ideals of justice equal for all citizens. However, this image of judges does not reflect the daily reality for most American judges. <clears throat> Okay. Thus it is that as this page also says, the judge is a member of the courtroom work group, which suggests that in reality the judge is not a neutral arbiter. It is on the side of those three individuals. <clears throat> Sentences tend to be routine. <clears throat> and likewise, tend uh, to do you know, certain things. Lawyers who routinely try cases in front of judges, just like the clerk of the court, can give you a fair guess as to what the judge's sentence in a particular case will be. <clears throat> Some judges, for instance, are heavily against <clears throat> um, drug cases, and therefore, if a case involving narcotics comes in front of them, the odds are <clears throat> that they're going to double down on the defendant in sentencing if they can. Likewise, <clears throat> sexual offenses, which has become so prevalent in uh, today's world, much more prevalent than we were used to see. Once again, certain judges are just really bear down on it. Uh, <clears throat> again, it depends on the judge and his or her beliefs regarding that subject. Uh, but frequently, even the most flimsiest of evidence of the defendant's guilt adds up to maximum sentences being imposed. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is judges are not necessarily neutral. The judges are not necessarily uh, involved and, and quite frankly judges also uh, <clears throat> frequently rule in cases depending on what their past was before they became a judge. In this state most circuit judges are former prosecutors and that should give you an idea of where they're going to come down in many criminal cases. There are exceptions. <clears throat> uh, former Judge David Knight, who was a prosecutor in Mercer County for 16 years, <clears throat> in my opinion, probably was the fairest circuit judge that I ever saw in action. And the reason is because all those years as prosecutor meant that he truly knew defendants and their actions in various situations much better than the average judge might. <clears throat> and uh, I don't think anyone ever tried to chase it for a judge like could truthfully say that he was heavily biased in front of the prosecutors. But that's not necessarily the case in many other circuit judges. You can tell from the beginning that those judges <clears throat> don't like defenses, defense attorneys, or don't like defendants 
physicians in cases particularly. And you see them ruling time and time again on routine motions for the prosecution, not the defense. <clears throat> and it's pretty obvious from the start of the trial. Which is why, once again, the concept of a bench trial that is a trial only in front of a judge without a jury uh, <clears throat> is to me so problematic. Uh, again, this is my own personal opinion regarding bench trials. And again, uh, Virginia attorneys would probably argue with me that in some types of cases, judges are going to have a fairer decision than others. But I still have my personal doubts about that kind of trial. In West Virginia, it's almost impossible to have a bench trial. Because of the constitutional guarantee of trial by jury, <clears throat> and also the fact that there are lots of hoops you have to go through to, to do so. I did not say it could not be done, but no, by and large, no defense attorney in this state willingly subjects their client to a bench trial. But the same for juveniles. <laughs> What'd you say? Is that the same for juveniles? <clears throat> well, juveniles are different. And that's because juries in juvenile cases are rare. So rare that you never hardly ever hear about them. <clears throat> and of course, I would also comment that jury juvenile cases are always under seal or kept secret. And so, therefore, uh, the public really doesn't know if there was a jury trial. Yeah, the news media is aware of the jury trial. <clears throat> but they can't go to the court on it. Or what happened there? Uh, other than to say uh, the suspect in a case who was a juvenile was convicted, they can't say his name, his or her name. Right, they can't give any information about the person. So, generally speaking, <clears throat> you don't see press coverage of juvenile matter except the most sensational cases. And juvenile matters are tried only in front of judges for the, for the most part. Uh, now, the one exception is that West Virginia has liberal has the rules about how a juvenile may be tried as an adult. And therefore, if a juvenile is 16 or older and the crime is severe enough, and then I'm talking about murder, robbery, rape, uh, that 16 year old can be tried and sentenced as an adult. It's called a transfer case. Yeah, you have to have a transfer hearing on it, etc. Follow the rules, but it's not as difficult as you might think to do so. <clears throat> Most transfer cases, therefore, are only for violent crimes, not for lesser offenses. And of course, uh, there are certain uh, constitutional issues which have come up from the Supreme Court rulings regarding what kind of sentences can be handed down to juveniles. In particular, life imprisonment and the death sentence. So, uh, a life sentence uh, given to a juvenile who says 16 at the time they commit a murder is not necessarily uh, a given. Okay. However, uh, Again, we have these rules which basically uh, have talked about life without parole as being uh, uh, an unconstitutional sentence. And again, it depends on the state you're in. But I think it also depends on the nature of the crime. Uh, <clears throat> certainly someone who does a mass shooting and is 17 would not be an issue regarding them getting uh, life without parole, but the Supreme Court's pretty clear you cannot put the death sentence on a juvenile. 
So that leaves only open the issue of how much prison time do you give the person? Um, yeah, they're always banging on something. So, uh, excuse me. <laughs> but I am glad you brought up the issue about juveniles because they are, they're completely different. There is a juvenile courtroom work group, but it is not the same as for adults. And uh, the best way to explain that is that in juvenile cases, there is a fourth person thrown into the mix. And that person is the juvenile probation officer or department. And prosecutors basically follow the rules of the juvenile probation department not normal prosecution. Okay, so that changes situations. Uh, and I'm sure when you take a class, uh, take the class strictly in juvenile delinquency, you hear some of these things, you learn some of these things. Uh, but by and large, because of the nature of juvenile proceedings, uh, which are usually aimed at something less than imprisonment for a person. Uh, and then again, the court functions differently. You see, in West Virginia, you're supposed to look for the least restrictive alternative in sentencing the juvenile. Now, I'll make my other final comment here on juveniles. It is true that juveniles are incarcerated and they are sent to a prison, a juvenile prison, frequently talked about in most states, not as a prison, but as a school. It used to be called reform schools. Literally, that was the name, the West Virginia Reform School, located at Prometown. That was its name. Now it's called the West Virginia uh, School for Youth or something of that nature. <clears throat> and of course, its location has been changed. But it is a prison. It has a high fence and it has guard towers and it has bars. And nothing school about it. You don't want to let him in. Yeah. Five dollars. Five dollars. Give me the twenty dollars. I want now. I want you all online to know that I've just been offered a bribe to let this student come into class. However, uh, as you all know, I do have a price, but it is not twenty dollars. It is six figures. <laughs> and, and I don't mind advertising it. Six figures. I've never in 32 years ever had a student even thought about having offered to offer me that much money. So I tried to bribe you. <laughs> no one has ever tried to bribe me. Because they know that I demand more money than than they possibly have <laughs> or could have. <clears throat> At any rate, my price probably will go up after this year. Inflation. Six it's figures. now going to be 200000 <laughs> um. I'll have to double my previous price. <laughs> Is that for one class or is that? No, that's per class. Per, as per class? Per class. You see, it's an impossible thing to match. <laughs> Fortunately, now somebody's going to crowdfund for 200 grand tonight. Offer me a bribe. We know me, but it's still fucking if they perform. It's still fucking. 
Which, by the way, as you all know, I do not trunk people. They exalt themselves. They earn what they get, not I don't give it. Anyway, back to the subject of the courts. In the courtroom, what room? <clears throat> I'm trying to get rid of the issue of judges early <clears throat> in our discussions. Because I don't want I want you to understand that judges remain, for the most part, in adult criminal felony cases, a minor player. <clears throat> the most important role the judge plays is the sentence, not the issue of guilt or innocence itself. Okay. And again, my voice being what it is. Uh, I may have to stop short today just simply because of the fact that I won't be able to talk in my additional two classes today. <clears throat> anyway, the other two parties in the courtroom work group were the prosecutor and the defense attorney. And as it is pointed out, in subsequent articles, that is Article 14 and 15, and finally uh, 17, the key player in the whole trial process is the prosecutor. Not the police, it's the prosecutor. Because, <clears throat> as the text points out, from the time someone is arrested until uh, the final disposition of the case, Decisions made or not made by a prosecutor become the most important thing that determines what happens in an individual situation. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> what happens in an individual situation? Um, <clears throat> so, when we speak about prosecutors, and that's what we're going to spend probably more time on than defense attorneys, <clears throat> I do want you to understand that by and large, prosecutors, <clears throat> by their nature, uh, are the most important player and also uh, by manipulating the process as they can uh, truly decide what things are or what things are not. Although normally <coughs> I am not necessarily a fan of the many law and order shows by Dick Wolf. You know, there's, as we know, more than one. The basic the law and order show, the first one, still is focused <clears throat> primarily not on the policing aspect, but on how the prosecuting attorneys seek at all costs to convict criminals of the crimes for which they are accused. <coughs> Indeed, defense attorneys in those shows, <coughs> to use an old phrase, are constantly denigrated by saying that, oh, their only role here is to try to get a guilty criminal off the book. <clears throat> okay? 
And that's how they're portrayed in these shows. <clears throat> in any of them. Basically, that defense attorneys are uh, <clears throat> at best a necessary evil in the process. <clears throat> and <clears throat> uh, usually that they simply are an obstacle to justice being carried out. <clears throat> and I would maintain the reverse is true. That by their actions, prosecutors, <clears throat> and by the power that the prosecuting attorney typically has, that it is the reverse. <clears throat> and that is that innocent defendants frequently go to prison <clears throat> because of prosecutorial misconduct or other actions by prosecutors, which basically prevent a, a decent defense. <clears throat> and <clears throat> that's why, to me, <clears throat> when we discuss the court system, it's always so problematic for me to talk about prosecutors <clears throat> being fair-minded or even-minded because reality is few are. Now, there are some trailblazing prosecutors at, across the country <clears throat> who are, have found themselves to be deeply committed to reform in the criminal justice system. And that's because they see so many flaws that take place. On the other hand, however, since most prosecutors are elected, what gets them elected is not saying that they're going to be more lenient on defendants. Not saying that they're going to, uh, you know, uh, have less criminals put in prison, but the reverse, right? They, that they're tougher, that they're the meanest dog in the junkyard, for want of a better term. And that therefore, it is these, this is what they get elected for, and this is what takes place. Uh, the, one of the best examples I can give you of that process <clears throat> is uh, the issue of, of Bill Cosby. Now, Bill Cosby, of course, in his prime. <clears throat> The star of the number one television show in America. He single handedly, his, his sitcom single handedly saved NBC from bankruptcy. However, in his later years, and this is before the Me Too movement, in his later years, he begins being accused by different women of having uh, sexually, usually sexually assaulting them. <clears throat> um, and a number began to come forward, most of whom discussions were so, had taken place so long ago that under Pennsylvania law, they couldn't be present. I think he's in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> anyway, there is a statute of limitations not in West Virginia, but in many states, in my family cases. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> a candidate for prosecute for prosecuting attorney is elected when he tells prospective voters that if elected, he will try Bill Cosby for some offense. And so what happens is that when that he is elected, Mr. Cosby is then put on trial for again a claim <clears throat> 15 years ago or something like that. <clears throat> it's not a new claim, it's an older claim. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, there are issues in the case. Since Mr. Cosby goes to trial, and guess what? This prosecutor. Uh, who has uh, staked his career on putting Mr. Cosby in jail, <clears throat> the jury simply doesn't believe his accuser. 
And as a result, they have a hung jury in the case, which everybody, all the media thought was going to be a slam dunk case. Well, it's not a slam dunk case. The case is yet to be retried. And uh, I'm not sure whether the same prosecutor is still in office or not, but the point remains that that's what happens when you have prosecutors who are only elected with the junkyard dog. Yes. <clears throat> So, prison reform, correction reform, uh, criminal justice reform uh, is, generally speaking, the least thing that <coughs> is discussed in election campaigns of prosecutors. <coughs> Unfortunately, of course, we're paying the price for some of those decisions since, right, <coughs> since the 1991 to in particular, 1994 revolution in the criminal justice process, in which the warehousing of more people for more for more time, uh, the uh, trying to end early release of individuals, resulted, of course, in our prison population exploding to what it is now. <clears throat> uh, more and more states have suddenly had to come up with the fact that they can't just keep arresting everybody to get out of various problems or ills. And you all know I've always soapboxed about that issue. <clears throat> but more and more prosecuting attorneys are beginning to realize that they are part of the problem, not just an innocent bystander. So, okay, now, finally, uh, my comment here, and I'm, I really am about to run out of steam, I'm afraid. The one thing that empowers prosecutors also, other than what they get elected for, is the fact that there is almost little, if any, penalty for prosecutorial misconduct in this state country. What does it take to impeach or to remove a prosecutor, a state elected prosecutor from office? Mm -hmm. Do you all know? Uh, well, there is, <clears throat> as part of the West Virginia State Bar, a special committee <clears throat> who looks at not just judicial misconduct, but can also look at prosecuting attorney misconduct. Has a prosecuting attorney been removed from office in this state in the last 25 years? You all were shaking your head, you don't know, and I have to be blunt. Uh, I know who they were. <clears throat> and that was a prosecuting attorney at that time from Monroe County. Yeah, it's been more than 25 years. Who was <clears throat> alleged and convicted of the crime of bigamy. That's right, he married a young woman while well, still married. <clears throat> and because of his political disfavor, ended up being forced to leave office. How many others have been so? How long have they? <clears throat> Even if an individual has been kept in prison, as we just heard up here this morning, for 32, seven years for a crime for a rape he did not commit. What penalty is there for the prosecutor who <clears throat> misled the court, or didn't turn over evidence or hid things, or maybe manufactured evidence? And the answer is little, if any. <clears throat> little, if any. Therefore, Prosecutorial misconduct takes place every day. That's just not my opinion. That is a fact. 
every day, we see continually cases in which prosecutors have hidden evidence. Okay. And uh, misused evidence, sometimes manufactured evidence. Also, they can gain convictions when there may be significant uh, side issues regarding the fact that uh, the defendant may be innocent of a crime. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's not uncommon, even though the public perception is that it is. It rarely happens. I always like to look at the trial regarding the late Ted Stevens, who at the time was an elected senator from Alaska, who had elected twice. <clears throat> who was pursued by federal prosecutors for allegedly spending campaign funds or whatever uh, to do repairs on his house. Uh, not billions of dollars, like 50 or 60,000 dollars. Okay? They went so far in the case in which he was put on trial, that a key witness they had, who supposedly would have convicted Mr. Senator Stevens, when the prosecutors learned he's not going to testify in their case, put him on a plane and fly him to Alaska so he would be available. The day before the trial starts. Lots of other information they intentionally kept from court. Now, Ted Stevens dies, loses re election because of this prosecution. He dies in a plane crash before he was totally exonerated from any of the charges against him. But what happened to the federal prosecutors? Squat. A woman or lady. Quit. If they were fired on mass for what they did. And so I point that out before the trusting attorneys are the most powerful person in the workroom because they have the least worry about their job and liking. Now I'm gonna have to confess. That is, as long as I can talk right now, and it's nice noise is going on outside. And let me be quiet and see if the microphone's picking it up. Uh, a little bit. Um, I'm going to have to stop right now. Go ahead. So I hope y'all are part of I can't I simply I cannot I can't talk about this noise outside. Anyway, we will take up the next class, Article 14, on the decision to prosecute or not. Because that's the first major decision to prosecute or do the work. Mm -hmm. See, they even have a case too. We have a case too. And that decision takes place earlier than we uh, With that in mind, I'm going to sign off right now because I don't, I don't think I have any more questions. And I'll be better prepared, hopefully, day after tomorrow. Of course, by then I may not even be able to talk at all. So we'll see.